glad to see you guys and uh, happy holidays to everybody. Um, I hope everybody is happy and safe and got all their shopping done. So um, I'm very excited about this talk today, guys. Um, I was, uh, I had found Peter this year and I found him on the Rune Soup podcast. And basically in that um, podcast, he was talking about the same material that we're going to be talking today. And I was absolutely intrigued because even though I have been in this area for a while, I really didn't have a good grip on what the mysteries actually were until I heard Peter talking. And Peter's talk was a revelation to me because uh, I think what we all think of possibly these days as mysteries, uh, particularly when it comes to these modern day mystery schools, um, I think we have a slightly erroneous idea about what they might have been. And possibly the idea of these modern day mystery schools that you can get on the website might be misleading us a little bit, I think. So, Peter, welcome. Hi there, Venice. Lovely to see you again. <laughs> lovely to see you too, and all of our <laughs> lovely guests. So, Peter, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the mysteries actually are? Yeah, I mean, um... It's taken me years to kind of work out, recontextualize them, let's say. And uh, part of the problem has been is the kind of classical philology and archeology span have dominated this field, at least in terms of the Hellenistic mysteries. Um, and for instance, when you turn to the Egyptian mysteries, the, we don't seem to have any reliable source material at all. So it's been really wide open to a lot of speculation and um, a lot of what I would call formalism. My approach, though, has been very much informed by ethnography and the comparative ethnography um, of, of what Mercia Aliade called the higher rites of initiation. Now, although anthropology as such deals with ritual ad nauseum, um, it does so from a, a social, almost like a sociological perspective. Whereas the mysteries are intrinsically esoteric. And in fact, they, they form the esoteric life of communities during the um, polytheistic era, let's call it, uh, certainly of the Hellenistic world. Um, so we need to really um, position them in terms of the fact that they are not rites of passage. For a long time, people have mixed these, the mysteries up as rites of passage. And, and you have some very strange texts emerging out of 19th century occultism in which the model of rites of passage has been welded to what they thought the Egyptian mysteries were. And we have all these strange accounts of people crawling around tunnels under the pyramids and everything, which is, well, it's, I'm sorry to say, it's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so what the, when we talk of the mysteries, we're talking about Syrio-Egyptian and Hellenistic rites that were not rites of physical ordeal. Okay, that's important. Um, the only mystery rites that I know of that seem to have had this element of physical ordeal, the rites of Mithras. And then they were peculiarly um, the ritual process within the, the Roman legions, for instance. So there's kind of a, a merger there with traditional men's societies and rites of initiation into them, which, you know, it's a different beast really. So focusing on the Hellenistic rites, um, they're, they're, they're not rites of passage. That's the first important thing. Um, rites of passage, for instance, involve everybody within a community. You can't escape them. The mysteries, however, never uh, um, attracted more than a tiny percentage of any community. Really, uh, even among the devotees of a particular deity, it would never be more than uh, 30 to 40 percent of them would go forward to take the mystery initiations. OK, now the mystery initiation itself is, is always in two parts. Essentially, you cannot approach the deity without extensive purification. 
and, and in the Hellenistic world, uh, you know, this katharmos, the the, um, the cleansing of what they call miasma. It's it's the the <laughs> the bad karma we carry from life to life, or through the ancestral line, or from having committed acts of injustice. You cannot go into the mysteries whilst carrying this burden. And we'll talk about a little why that was so important for them. So preliminary rites of purification, this, this small percentage of people who went into the mystery rites took the purification rites, okay, and then stopped there. They didn't go on to the main initiation. Okay. Okay. Why? Well, basically, the main initiation was a direct confrontation with the numinous. You were going to be plunged into the presence of a deity. And it was kind of openly felt that as the deity came into this ritual space, that space would be flooded by all kinds of entities and beings that were thought of as traveling in the entourage of the deity. Now, <laughs> given that these rites are taken, taking place late at night, <laughs> with flickering torches, and um, certainly some of them, for instance, at Samothrace involved a descent, a winding descent down into the valley, you know, in the, <laughs> it was a bit too much for most people. So, you know, of the of of the people who went forward for initiation, then you know, one in ten would then go on into the main initiation rite, where they'd have a direct communication and connection with the deity. As I said at the beginning, this is very much a, a um, an esoteric and cult practice in polytheistic societies. Okay. Um, one of the reasons for that is that monotheistic um, religious communities have too abstract a notion of deity, okay? The polytheistic deities are very specific about their qualities, their individual myth cycle. Um, and it's through that semi-human narrative that people are able to relate to them emotionally. Okay, so once the monotheistic religions took over, it's not really possible to continue with that. And in any case, the, the monotheistic religion or Christianity was intolerant of everything except its own Nicene dogma, essentially. So another characteristic of the mystery rites is they tend not to leave behind a narrative, a doctrine, um, much more than, than remains, accidental remains, we, we might say. Firstly, because they had absolute requirement of secrecy. And secondly, because they were not inclined to produce doctrinal texts, even though they had, in some cases, recognized police, priesthoods. Um, the core of the thing was personal experience. So they, they, they represented what's called today an imagistic form of um, religious mode, and it's contrasted with doctrinal modes. So this imagistic mode is, it's, your experience is the valid experience. It's what you were meant to have had. And there's no one to question that, so to speak. In addition to that, the priesthood who perform the rites need to have a lineage. They need to have an ongoing commitment and connection with the deity because they act as the intermediaries. So if we now talk a little briefly about the ritual process. So we're going to talk about the Villa of the Mysteries shortly. So I just want to contextualize what we're going to see over there. The mysteries were all uh, energized by dance. Okay, it's important to recognize there was music and dance going on. And if you want a modern parallel to that, you can listen to the music of Daemonia Nymphae, the Hellenistic musicians. And one or two of their numbers give you the emotional lift that must have been experienced by the ritualists 
during the Hellenistic mysteries. So it, it's a specific type of music that lifts you out of yourself. Um, and that means that the uh, performance of the rites had to be done by people who were skilled in that music. They, they had to be able to perform it with the right instruments and do the dance steps. Now this ritual performance generated an energy field. It's called spatium. It is a esoteric field. It is intersubjective. I say it's neither subjective nor objective. And the impact of that energy field is to lift one's awareness upwards, to shift it out of the normal mode. Now, you need to recall these people have spent several months preparing for this ritual. And that involved abstinence from foods and sexual activity, um, purifications, devotions, giving offerings, a whole regime of, of inner preparation building up to this supreme uh, initiation rite. And then they'd have the ritual purification and then they'd be into the main ritual, into this intense ritual space. Now, the purpose of the ritual then is to energize what we would call in esoteric language, the egregore of the particular mystery rite. And this is the symbolic world of that deity and part of its myth cycle, which through millennia becomes a thing in itself. Okay, it's, it's, it's an intersubjective mental space, a field of consciousness. So the ritual enables the ritualists to um, engage with that space, to enter it as though they were within a virtual reality. And it's that point, that egregoric virtual reality space that serves as the interface between the human ritualists and the deities, the higher order beings that are seeking to be invoked. Okay, so that's the mechanism. So we can look at the, um, the ritual space of the Dionysian mysteries now, if you like, Venice. We have yes. some images for people to look at. Well, so so before I, you go there, if I'm oh. talking too much, just jump in. No, you never <laughs> talk too much, my dear. Um, Vidi, can you name that uh, band again? And I, uh, Peter uh, turned me on to it literally just this week, and the music is amazing. So it's Nymph yeah, Diamond. Daemonia. Daemonia. Nymphae. Nymphae. Okay, yeah. so that's for Kyle. Um, sweetie, I just want to uh, make the point that the thing that astounded me the most before we go on to the slides was that it is a direct experience of a higher order being. Yeah. And that is something that is wow for a start. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, just the mm. idea that, and I'm sure that it's probably something that is quite scary as well, which is why you only had one in 10 go through the actual process and why a lot of you know, people literally chickening out. Yeah, and even during the process, some people were kind of in a state of like shivering, quaking, <laughs> fear. You know, it, it, it's such a, it's a bit, a bit like the UFO uh, abduction scenario, you know, you're suddenly in the presence of something so utterly other. And its energy is, is of, a, of a intensity and quality. It's quite, you know, beyond our experience. And yet, in that moment, you, you have a merger of awareness between humanity and that higher order of awareness. And that was the key. That's why people were doing this. Because all of a sudden, they could perceive reality from, if you like, God consciousness. And even though it was a transient experience of that, it completely relativized all day-to-day -day life and problems thereafter. And especially the perennial problem of death. Because that, that experience gave you a sense of your essential continuity from life to life and, and, and with a much higher order of consciousness than you could ever experience in your purely embodied uh, existence. So it kind of broke all the seals that defined you as a limited 
person and and it's the one consistent thing that we 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 have from the, that period is the people who commented on it like cicero like apuleius and these were major intellectuals in their day was that it it just changed their relationship with reality and and cicero went on to say that you know this this changed perception is at the root of of civilization i mean once you have that perception it changes the way you relate to society as well so th this was as profound as you could get and look in talking to you about this today these actual mystery traditions are incredibly rare i mean you basically told me there's one school left that actually conducts rites in this manner correct Indo-Tibetan rites of the higher yoga tantra. The the uh, I'm getting a message here. Okay, we we're okay. There was a brief yes, pause on the there. internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going. We're still going, so it's good. But yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> so the Indo-Tibetan uh, Indo higher yoga, yoga tantra, yoga. Um, and, and those rites are being attested at least from the 8th or 9th century CE, although I, I believe they're probably much older, but certainly documented from 8th, 9th century CE, and they're still practiced today. So they, they, they function. Now, when I said at the beginning, my approach to understanding the mysteries has been ethnographic. It's because of the existence of rites like that, that we can use uh, our knowledge of them to... to um, illuminate the earlier Syrian, Egyptian and, and, and Hellenistic mystery rites. So based on the testimony of, of initiates, comparing that with contemporary accounts, we get, can kind of narrow down a, a sense in which, in which they were functioning. And look, I think, which we'll move to now, the slides. Um, yeah. It's, uh, we're very, very lucky to have such a complete account of the process in this Villa de Mysteries. How do you say it, sweetie? I'm going to put them put, put it up so that we can go through them. Is it the Villa of the Mysteries, correct? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay, all right. So yeah. the, the existence second. of these frescoes is purely accidental. Um, you there, Venice? <laughs> You're getting there. Amazing, getting there. I, uh, I have them. Here we go. All right, my love. Okay, here we go. Can you see them now? Yeah, lovely. And just before we go on here, guys, um, I've, I can see we have two questions. So we have a chat box and yeah. we have a question box. So pop your questions in the question box because that's where we're going to go to for the questions. All right, sweetie. So let's go, my, my dear. All right. Okay, let's so... We can move on one slide. Okay, all, all this is illustrating is that all the uh, southern part of Italy was colonized by Greek city-states very early on, like by the 8th century. So although we're looking at essentially Greek rites at the Villa of the Mysteries, um, they're taking place in a Rome, uh, elite Roman context. Okay, this is the eyes wide shut of the Roman imperial world. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, we can go on. Okay, this is the villa. Um, it, it's roughly 3,700 square meters, 60 odd rooms, just on the edge of Pompeii. And it was hit by the pyroplastic blast when Vesuvius erupted in, what was it, 79 CE or something. So <laughs> it's absolutely remarkable that it's standing and B, that the frescoes are almost intact. And if you look on the uh, plan of the building on the right, you can see two little illuminated red squares. The, the smaller one is a kind of preparation room which we'll look at first. And then the larger room to the right is, is actually the room where these elite Roman women enacted the mysteries. So sweetie, the rest of the home was an operational functional house? Oh yeah. 
Yes, definitely. Of course, one of the characteristics of elite Roman life is that everyone who was their, so to speak, client would visit each morning and kind of the, the elite would sit at the front of the house and greet them and um, listen to requests and grant favours, you know, it's exactly the same as in Godfather. I was going to say, <laughs> no, okay. no different, no different at all. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So they would come in and on very special occasions, they would head the, through the tablinum. Okay. The, the back of the house was off limits. Um, recent study of this architecture has demonstrated that the house was divided up into at least three different suites. And the two red rooms are part of a suite, which is the most difficult to access in terms of the complexity of the corridors and also furthest away from the public areas of the house. So this, this was totally off limits, this. You couldn't get there except by private invitation. Fantastic, all right. Okay. So this is the little red room. Um, it, when we say little, it, it's obviously a, a decent sized room and it, it has a clear decorative theme. It, it, you know, it's second style of Roman um, wall painting, these three bands. But it's, it's interesting in as much as the decoration is already Dionysian. And this is quite, quite unique. Um, it was often thought that maybe these were dining rooms, but actually the dining rooms that have been found in Pompeii um, have a very different Dionysian decorative. It's all about wine jars, nymphs and satyrs and all, all good fun stuff, right? Here you're seeing a priestess and a ritual dancer. I mean, the decorative scheme is already looking towards Dionysian cult activity. And we're thinking that this room was used for preparation. The little door there that you can see, it looks like it's being cut into the wall at a later stage. And if we pass through there, we'll go into the main room. It's absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? And so you immediately see the, the scale of the decorative scheme is vastly expanded. Although it's still this second style of Roman wall painting, the figures are almost life-size here. And they are all engaged in ritual activity. Now, we need to consider this room in two different lighting conditions, as you see it now, which daytime. Um, and I talked earlier about how these mystery rites were imagistic in their mode of operation. They were experiential. They didn't have a body of doctrine that you had to learn or canonical texts that you could refer to and so on. So it was important to capture the ritual process somehow so it wouldn't be lost. And I believe that's what this fresco cycle is about. So. In daylight, it serves as a theater of memory. It's a way of recording the key moments in the ritual process. Now, we can't do this, unfortunately, but if we were to cast this room into its nighttime mode of operation, when it was lit by small flickering torches, candlelight, there were shadows dancing, there would be dance and the ritual music playing, the whole atmosphere would change and the figures on the wall would be lit and then cast in shadow in a flickering uh, light. So you can see how the room would come alive in a completely different way during the ritual itself. It is so almost think, like an animation kind of thing. Yeah, and, and yeah. It, it's structured like an animation, uh, Venice, because, you know, the figures overlap with each other. They overlap with the background architecture. So it has a flow as though it were the, uh, the individual snapshots of a movie film, you know, of a, of a reel of film laid out. Um, okay, we can move forward a little if you like. How big is this room? I, it's seven by five, Venice, seven sure? meters by five meters. So it's, a, it's a fairly big room. Yeah, it's the space here for the ritual dancers. I would guess five dancers could easily circle in the middle of it. There would need to be the initiate and several 
uh, priestesses and the initiator. In this right. case, it's an initiatrix. Yes, that is okay. A good we're point. we're going to come to that. This is okay. this is totally female ritual space. Now, jumping out of the room, <laughs> the reason this is here is that this is a um, floor mosaic from Algeria, from two centuries removed and on a different continent. Okay. But the three figures you see here, you'll find them repeated in the frescoes. So what this tells us is that the figures we're looking at are not uh, depictions of real people. Okay. They are taken from a style book of Dionysian mystery initiation figures. They are standardized uh, elements. Okay. So if we move forward a little, I've just put them together, the fresco with the mosaic, so, and we can wow. go on to the, they're identical basically in their activity and, and posture, and again there, and again there. So going on, and here, the, the women on the left were doing the same ritual. Um, here, the statue is actually looking the other way, but the, the fresco figure is modeled on it. So going forward again, Gosh, sweetie, I mean, that's amazing. This, you know, <laughs> okay, so we're, we're seeing a standardized it. figures going about the typical ritual processes involved in the Dionysian initiative. The one thing that I think may relate to contemporary reality is the faces. And I suspect that the elite women who commissioned this work probably had their faces at it. <laughs> But that's just a guess. Okay, so we can look at these different groups briefly, if you like, Venice. Yes, please. Okay. Can we move forward one? Okay, so this is the first group. And what we've got here, uh, we know that the Romans tended to leave traditional rites in the hands of people from that ethnicity. And so we would expect, expect the initiatrix to be Greek. And in fact, the artist has given her a Greek peplos. The dress is Greek, not Roman. Okay, so he's, he's like showing us that, yes, this is a Greek person. And we know that they would um, perform these initiations as a family group. So that could be her daughter and her daughter's son. That would be a typical unit to um, go about on contract basis doing these initiations and on the basis of their lineage, they would have a lineage of doing this. She is, um, oops, <laughs> she is uh, holding the shawl in, in a way which uh, is typical of Roman priestesses. And what I'm guessing here is that the Roman artist is trying to find a way to convey what this woman represents. She's actually a Greek priestess of the Dionysian mysteries. And we can, we even know her cult title from other archeological finds. It would be Dracaena, the dragoness. And the reason she's called the dragoness is she embodies the fierce energy, the Kundalini energy necessary to empower this ritual process, okay? She's capable of invoking the deity and that's why she's there. That's why her lineage is so important. Without the lineage here, you don't have a right, you have theater, okay? So that's the first group of three. Um, the other woman is simply directing the child to read the liturgy. And these children could be, you know, four or five years old or up to nine years old. So she's keeping a careful eye on it. He doesn't miss his place in, 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 in the liturgy as he reads it out. The woman on the right bearing the honey cakes is the initiate. And she's dressed with white myrtle in her headband. The honey cakes are an offering um, to the deity. Now, one thing that we need to understand is the mystery deities were all Catholic. They were all underworld deities. They had that intimate connection with the underworld and with death and death rites. 
And in a sense, the mystery rite reenacts the process of dying. And Plutarch even talks about the process of dying as paralleling the experience of undergoing the mysteries. So she has the honey cakes as an offering to the deity. Uh, everyone else is an initiate in this space. She isn't. So she needs to protect herself <laughs> from the energies that are going to be inflowing. And she's turned towards us, actually. So she breaks the linear movement of the uh, fresco cycle, looks at us and offers in her hand a green sprig of myrtle. So she's actually offering an invitation to initiation here. It's a beautiful feature of the frescoes. OK, we can move forward. Oops. OK, all this is is an Orphic bowl, has to say a, a bowl of the Dionysian mysteries from roughly contemporary with the frescoes. And it shows the ritualists all making ritual gestures around the edges. And at the center is a dragon emanating an energy. So the, we can now understand why the initiatrix um, had the ritual title of Dracaena. What a gorgeous when it, she's ball. When she's possessed by the energy, she is as the dragon herself. And the dragon is a, a form, uh, a manifestation of the deity. Dionysus has several zoomorphic forms. One is the serpent, dragon, uh, another is the, uh, the goat, uh, and so on. So, so this Orphic bowl kind of um, sums up the intensity of the process that this initiatrix is about to unleash. Okay, can we now go just, forward? Just to stop you for a second, Orphic uh, comes out of, uh, or is related to Orpheus. Mm-hmm underworld and that's where that term comes from yeah yes. um I, I think to understand the context there venice is that the orphism was was generally thought of as a body of of uh, beliefs related beliefs for instance the eternal life of the soul its incarnation in subsequent lives uh, and the importance of ritual initiation for its purification and so on so those beliefs roughly we can call Orphism. And I think they evolved as the city states evolved. And during the like 10th to 9th centuries coming out of the Iron Age, um, the suddenly greatly increased levels of communication and trade meant that Dionysian cults that had operated in remote villages in the countryside or on the seaside um, developed a shared language which I think is, is, is where Orphism evolved. It's a way of putting the Dionysian ritual process and beliefs into a common or shared uh, framework. Fantastic. Okay. I, I had researched Orphism for a while and I never got such a succinct explanation. So thank you for that. No, Charlie. you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> like you need like 72 books or five minutes with Peter, basically. So, you know. <laughs> All right, this is my favorite one for some reason. I love this picture. This is uh, what these women are doing is blessing a statue, uh, which is lying down in, in the container the woman on the left is, is holding. And the, the woman in the middle is a priestess. We know that because of her headdress. And what she has, uh, we, we'll see this at the end of the uh, fresco cycle we'll see it actually being done, but it is a hairstyle known as the Senecrines, which was a Roman uh, hairstyle that defined a priestess. And it involved taking three braids from either side of the head and crossing them over the top. And the fringe was made into, again, two braids and crossed over. And then it was bound around by these uh, wool fillets uh, called the infula. And then it was covered over by this head gear, this, this, this like turban, this uh, suffubulum. So she has her head turned in profile to us. And the reason the artist has done that is so we can see the layers of this head. So the, the artist again is communicating to us. He's, he's leaving a trail of clues that we can understand if we can decode the clothing and the footwear and so and again this woman is wearing an extremely rich saffron and purple 
clothing and is set on a saffron and purple. Um, that's probably her own uh, uh, toga, so to speak. One thing I just want to bring your attention to are the ends of the legs of the stool that she's sitting on. Yes, okay? that's very interesting. Can you see them? Mm. Have you ever seen a stool or a chair that ended in legs like that? <laughs> I, I looked at dozens of pieces of Roman furniture and I couldn't find one that looked like that. And um, the scarlet imprint, Peter Gray and Alcistus Demek came back to me and said, you know what, <laughs> there's mushrooms all over this fresco cycle. <laughs> the artist has modeled the feet of the couches and chairs and, and everything. So they have these mushroom shapes. Okay, and we're going to see Very why they're telling. important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't want to get ahead of myself. That's all right, John. But basically what they're doing here is purifying yeah. the instruments for the ritual. As far That's as right. I'm she holds a sprig of a some uh, bush in her hand and the other woman is pouring a liquid on it and then she'll use the sprig to spray liquid so the the liquid is blessed and then it's sprayed onto the statue so that the statue comes into the ritual space totally purified it doesn't have any clinging negativity to it okay oh there we go There's oh the there we go <laughs> <laughs> And remember to keep them as a close up. Yeah, there we go. I mean, <laughs> I need that furniture. That's the gorgeous. only thing missing is big, you know, red and white spots <laughs> on them. You know, that would that would do it for us. But OK. <laughs> OK, so all of a sudden the frescoes take a step turn in another direction. So we, we've looked at linear activity, linear ritual activity the priestess and her family starting the initiation, the initiate walking into the ritual space, the blessing. This is all human activity. And all of a sudden we're confronted by a completely different, all of the figures here are non-human. And we know that because their ears uh, have a very distinctive shape. And what we're all of a sudden being shown here is the Dionysian egregore. This is the ritual space. It is enacting the, the typical myth of Dionysus, who was hidden on Mount Nisa in the form of a goat and suckled there by the nature creatures. Okay, so we're all of a sudden in, in, in the, just after the conception of Dionysus and Silenus there was put over him as his instructor. Okay, so all of a sudden we're, we're, we're into the ritual space itself being depicted. Now the figure on the right with the billowing cloak is signaling to us that what we're about to see is profoundly secret and not to be talked about. And that's why her hand is, is raised in that fashion and the cloak is like covering up behind her. So if we move forward one, Venice, we can see the, this is the east wall. Now, what we're looking at here on the extreme left is the clues necessary to understand a ritual dance. Because once you contextualize that scene based on Dionysian mythology, you'll know that that's the point at which the child was danced around by the ritualists. So on the left hand side, it's saying the first ritual is the ritual purification dance. And on the right is the initiation proper. The center is the epiphany, the theophany of the deities, Dionysus and Ariadne. Okay, so the east wall facing east um, kind of encapsulates the ritual process. And the last figure, you, let's look at these last two figures on the right, uh, Venice. W the, the woman who's kneeling oh, is sorry, holding. No. There we go. Okay. Um, 
that one. Uh, she's holding um, a cloak and inside that cloak is the statue of the deity that we saw being purified. But a fold in the cloak has been shaped to look like a phallus. Ooh, okay. Yes. yes. Now, again, the, the artist is subtly leaving a clue about how the initiation was enacted. The figure with the black wings, I believe, is Lisa. And she was um, a demonic entity, very much associated with uh, Dionysian madness, ecstasy. And she has a whip hand, fully wound. <laughs> <laughs> She's about to deliver, you know. <laughs> Whoop ass. <laughs> one heck of a one heck of a blow. Um, she's fully accoutred as a Dionysian initiate. She has this nebris, which is the um, the hide of a leopard or cheetah tied around her waist, and she wears buskins on her feet. So she's accoutred as a Dionysian accomplice, let's say. So what's going to happen now is the whiplash of the initiation is about to be unleashed onto the initiate. I don't know if we want to go forward onto that. We've skipped quite a bit, but here's the corner of the room now of the east wall and the southern wall come together here. And you can see how the artist has er erased the corner by allowing the action to flow across it. I mean, the, the level of artwork we're looking at here is absolutely extraordinary. This is in the first century BC. You wouldn't see figuration like this for, oh, I know, something like another 1500 years in Europe. Amazing. You know, probably you would be thinking of Raphael. Yeah, Some, actually, you know, I can see a very, uh, uh, a great similarity to Raphael, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the depth of figuration is, uh, the modeling of the figures is so beautifully done. And after this, you know, it's totally lost in European art until the Renaissance. So anyway, the, the artist has used the, um, the span of action here to totally eliminate the obstacle that the corner would have represented to the flow of action, you know, it's an incredible piece of design. So, we have another ritual group here. Uh, there's a woman, the woman um, partly stripped, bent over, and she is the one who is about to get the full force of the initiation. Now, what I'd like to suggest here is that because all of this took place in one night, okay, they, they needed the result. They'd hired the Greek initiatrix and her family to come in to do this they needed a result. So they piled everything into the ritual process to do that. To, to, they had to have the result. They had the dance, they had the initiatrix bringing in the energy and they used the extract from the mushroom as a stimulant. And the way that they would administer that is so that it would go straight into the bloodstream in the fastest possible way. And that meant administering it either to the anus or the vagina. And because of the myth cycle of Dionysus, they would use the dildo or a lispo as it was called to administer it to the anus. And that was a standard medical treatment in antiquity. So there was nothing strange or weird about it. Okay, so the, the, the pure extract of, of the, the mushroom would kind of be the last, <laughs> the last kick into throwing the initiate directly into a state of ecstasy, which is represented by the dancing figure. And it's almost like the, on the right, you know, the golden flow of her cape is like the illumined uh, aura that she would have experienced at that, at that time. And the initiates would have seen her as illumined. And I can attest to that personally, I, in people who've had um, various forms of energy treatment, uh, often 
have exceedingly bright aura after undergoing it. So I think, again, the artist has a huge subtlety here. He's left clues about the ritual action, about the ritual egregore, the space, the intersubjective space, the quality of the energy, and how it was administered and how it affected the person to which it was directed. It's all concentrated into this in a very compact way. Okay, and it's only through comparative ethnography of ritual and personal experience that you can put these elements together now because the classical philology or the archaeology or the art history simply cannot reach into these corners by itself unaided. So, okay, we skipped over a big part of the frescoes, uh, Sorry, Venice. I'm not sure if it's important or not, but. <laughs> well, well, just so you know, we've got. Uh, this is the east wall we were talking about Lisa. Yeah, we skipped yeah. over the first two figures, didn't we? Well, this kind of ca encapsulates them, this one. So, so go we, forward we, we, again. Okay. So, Here. and one more. So this one, we didn't talk about, oh, sorry, go back one. This one, uh, we didn't talk about, I, I said the clues in the first group um, are Dionysus looking into a mirrored surface as a child. He's called the horned child, by the way. So he's already in a kind of theriomorphic form. Um, and he's distracted by the reflection. Now, the guy with the shield is typical of the Corybantic dancer. And I, I mentioned the Corybantic dancer in the ante room, room four, leading into this. Um, so he would be the ritualist who did the dance typically. And that dance is designed to, they would clash a, a sword against the shield as they danced around in an ecstatic way. And this would be uh, to like chase off um, negative attachments and entities. Okay, so the clue here is that the purification rite is performed in that way. Again, the artist has embedded it in there with suggestions of mythology and ritual activity, blended the two together. But so, you use the guy in the top left with the mouth open. That's just a mask. Okay. So I'm guessing that, you know, it's a theatrical mask and what it represents there is the Titans because in the mythology, it was the Titans, not Corybantic dancers, who danced around the deity and then stabbed him and ate him. And because they ate the deity, Zeus turned them all into ashes, zapped them, okay? And from those ashes, in Orphic belief, humanity evolved, okay? So we are of the titans these these underworld forces in our nature but we have this divine element within us that was the orphic mythology yes somebody wrote there zagreus dionysus zagreus the horn de horn deity um so that's kind of all encapsulated there as i say you, you know you need to lay the ritual process alongside the mythic tale and then blend them together and you kind of can work out all the intricacies of, of what's being mapped for us. So, sweetie, what's in her hand, this round thing? Is it, it, it on the right hand side? Okay, what she's got in her hand is a skein. That's it, it's a bundle of thread. And the myth again is that Dionysus married Ariadne. And Ariadne was the priestess who um, guided Perseus into the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur and used the thread to find his way out again. And then he, he, uh, he ran off with Ariadne, okay, and abandoned her on the island of Naxos. And as he sailed away, Dionysus shows up and, they, okay, <laughs> marries her. And, and, and there they are, the, the happy couple. Now, so she is, Ariadne is an ancient Mediterranean goddess, essentially. And so it's entirely appropriate that she's united with a, a, um, a fertility deity. 
and, and, and this, this pairing of um, goddess and fertility deity is echoed throughout the Mediterranean cultures. Uh, you know, is so many different names he's known by. And originally, of course, in Egypt is Osiris and Horus, you know, as the, the uh, vegetal deity or Tammuz, or he's known by so many names. And uh, so th this depiction captures that. It also, it is also a depiction of the moment of initiation in which the deity connects with the initiate. So that typically in the higher rites of initiation, the visualization is of the deity and consort together. You actually see them, okay? They inhabit the egregore from their side. You see it from the symbolic language of the egregore, but they're actually animated. So again, the artist is depicting that aspect of the egregore that would have been seen by the initiate. So when you check on the initiate afterwards and say, okay, well, what do you, do you see? You can immediately corroborate that the initiation has been valid. You'll notice that, for instance, Dionysus has one sandal on and one sandal off. This is called monosandalos. Um, and it's typical of initiatory procedures to have one foot on the ground. I mentioned earlier how these mystery deities are all chthonic deities. They're all underworld deities. So that's in recognition to that. And it's also a signal to the ritualists of how they should be dressed. So um, one hand of Dionysus is thrown up over his head, and this is called the epiphanic gesture. So again, the artist has, has given us the clue to say, this is the epiphany itself of the deities in the ritual process. So sweetie, this actually comes before the woman leaning over the lamp. Yeah, that's right. They, they put the two aspects of the initiation process on either side okay, okay. of the deities on the eastern wall okay that makes sense so it's more like formalistic than it is it's still actually a linear progression but <laughs> they had to put these two in the center of the east wall that you know it was actually there were only two full walls to enact the entire process because there's a huge window in that southern wall and there's a huge double doors in the <laughs> west wall so the, again, the artist had to look at this space, work out which figures needed to be depicted and then array them to give the continuity of ritual and the respect uh, necessary. Yes. And that's Isn't why you have the in the middle because they need yeah. to yeah. yeah, middle of the East Wall. So it's absolutely phenomenal piece of artwork on any level in execution, organization, it's absolutely phenomenal piece of work. So, sweetie, what's in his right hand? We have the left back in the epiphany mode, but there's like something, it looks like gold in his right hand. I'm not too sure. Um, the tail of it. Yeah, it's very difficult because we've lost. We lost, lost so much of it. And um, the only gold I'm aware of is we, we would have to see this blowing up but all of the women ritualists have large gold rings on their fingers mm. with a intaglio uh, centerpiece, um, red stone, into which they would have had incised uh, characteristic ritual symbols. And I found one of these rings for sale on eBay for about ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000, but it's a little out of my... <laughs> budget <laughs> wow my a genuine God. second century one still intact so uh, yeah so i was able to examine it very closely um all right shall i move on sweetie yeah we might as well move on yeah so we've done this we've done the ritual so this is kind of the final major um part of the ritual sequence you'll see the 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 legs of the stool all end in these mushroom shapes again <laughs> just in case now this woman is having her herb um, prepared 
in this characteristic uh, her style of the senicrine of the Roman priestess. And they're actually holding three braided uh, strands on the right hand side there. Again, the artist has supplied sufficient detail for us to reconstruct it. The interesting thing here is she's looking out directly at us. She's not looking at the reflections. And you'll recall that the figure of Dionysus at the beginning is looking at his reflection. Now, again, this is a, this is a piece of Orphic um, metaphysics. But what the mystery is saying is that when you look into reality, your soul is scattered in so many parts. Okay. But when you withdraw your attachment from reality, you reunite it back to its primary unity. And her not looking at her reflection is symbolic of the recapturing of her primal unity with, through the process of initiation. That having experienced this God consciousness for herself, she is complete in a very unique way. And, and that's kind of, there's only one more scene, I think, um, we can move on to, if you like. And this is the, uh, the woman at the very back of the ritual uh, space. She often thought of as, is this the woman who owns the villa? <laughs> but we saw that this pose actually is, again, characteristic of Dionysian imagery. Is that the face of the woman who owned the villa? Quite possibly. I, I believe so, but I can't prove it. Interesting thing here again is once more the strange legs on the couch. But the other strange thing is that the other half of the couch disappears into the wall. And what we seem to be having expressed here is the fact that after, you'll see the, she has the ritual ring on her finger. You can just make out the red stone yes on on her on her hand and the fact that she is now in a sense the well, how to describe it she is the kind of the consort of the deity that's it whoops <laughs> almost made it Vinice. i know i didn't know almost name. made it there we go oh well, well done. done that's it that's it Stop beautiful moving. Oh my gosh, oh. Look, I'm just, no, he's just going, hold on, oh, <laughs> hold on, I, oh, I don't know why, there we, it's just very sensitive, oh, look, all right, you guys, you're just going to have to buy Miss Dye, that's all I can say, <laughs> yeah, please, <laughs> <laughs> which actually, I should mention at this point that you we do have, have a couple, oh, we have a couple of slides to come, okay, great, now, um, the thing I wanted to mention about this woman is that half the couch disappears into the wall space. And as the initiate now, she is the kind of the consort of the deity. One of her cult titles will be Nymphae, as to say the, the consort of the deity. So she has the ongoing connection to the deity. And that is indicated because the couch is shared with the deity, but it's not in this dimension. Wow. Okay. So again, the, you know, the quality of thought that's gone into um, depicting this ritual process is the, of the highest order you can imagine. And, and the, the materials used are the most expensive. You know, the, that red, for instance, is cinnabar. It was, it was imported from the Black Sea coast of what is now Turkey. Had its own uh, pricing and taxation. It was so expensive. And the entire room is, is painted in red cinnabar. Um, and then these figures were painted on top of that. So no expense spurs. That's why I said this is the Roman eyes wide shut. This is the Roman elite uh, at their most intense, uh, Roman elite women, I have to say, at their most intense, uh, ritually intense moment. Sweetie, I just right. want to go back here. Um, yeah. Josh raised an interesting question about the legs here do look like a jed pillar, which is... A what, sorry? Oh, is, right. <laughs> yeah. so that is kind of interesting too, because they are an unusual kind of design. They are very unusual, yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay, all right. So I think that... Oh, there. So this is the book. 
Miss this is the book. Happy. This is the hardback. Yeah. Beautiful Christmas present. <laughs> Indeed, seriously. And guys, it is. I mean, this book. I have it. Um, the the detail in the pictures, the resolution of the pictures, but also uh, Peter goes into so much more depth, and it's so incredibly interesting. So uh, it's kind of a picture book, but the 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 commentary is mind blowing. So I highly recommend, this is the one that I have. Um, so I highly recommend it if you want to dive deeper into this information. Yeah. Um, if, have if, they're in, if they're in the US, they can order through Amazon now. Yes, uh, Amazon, or if you're not in the US, go through to Scarlet. scarletimprint.com. Yeah. Um, and so sweetie, I have a few questions. I uh, bet. <laughs> and guys, just because we are getting late, um, for Angel and Kier and Teresa, I'm going to ask and uh, I'm going to ask one question each because it's getting late for Peter there. So let me know which question you want. I'm ask. good for another hour, Venice. No. Oh, problem. you are. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the long questions. All right. So Jade, <laughs> one day. I mean, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so get your coffee, um, Jay. For one day, I want you to. Do it. Um, write your name phonetically for me because I have no idea how to say it. So, how might the recent eclipse, the coming eclipse, the coming conjunction? And, oh no! no. <laughs> yeah, so Peter, I can let you know. Peter is not the astrologer. Um, I would suggest, honey, go and talk to Isaac uh, Rodriguez. Um, I will get you his information. He'll be able to ha ha help that for you because this is not Peter's, um, you know, area. Forte. Forte. There we go. Yeah. All right. So here, uh, I've just wondered if you knew what would be the distinction between rehearsal and ritual. For instance, why would the deity not appear other than in the ritual space? Is it a feature of the intention or some other action? Yeah. Um intention is the key word there but it's not just the intention of the ritualists so the the manifestation of the deity is not like turning your light on and off it's not that kind of energy the only way to address a deity whatever your beliefs about the ontology about the being itself okay is as though you were addressing somebody who you really wanted to get on well with and who was kind of in a higher social or something dimension than yourself. You know, phenomenologically, that's the only way to go. It's, it's no good thinking like there's some automatic uh, button. You do this, the deity should appear. No, no, no. You, you, you really have to be in a respectful, dedicated, purified state of mind for that deity to show up there. But given that you have a high motivation and intent to share your awareness with the deity, it can happen. Okay, it's invocation or possession cult, if you like. And that's a huge uh, shift for me uh, hmm. in terms of understanding this. That was yeah. like ding, 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 ding. I had no idea about that idea. So that's a very big one, my dear. Um, I just want to interject. John uh, very nicely pointed out that you can buy the book in the US from Scarlet Imprint. However, one of the reasons we are doing this tonight is in hopes that somebody will actually buy a book from Amazon so that we can test it out. <laughs> because we uh, some, I got somebody to do that. Oh, you did? Okay, <laughs> it's working okay. fine. It's working fine. <laughs> All right, yeah, great. Well, yeah. Go ahead and buy it where you want, guys. But um, that was part of our initial discussion. So, yeah. all right. Teresa wants to know, she belonged to a Kundalini yoga community, which she left about seven years ago, because as it turned out, the founder was a charlatan, as often they are, my dear. Nonetheless, yeah. tantric practices were used and I had some significant experiences. Once I awoke during a meditation to a vision of Sri Yantra, in my mind's eye, but just before it was as if it didn't exist. We had been in a Sphinx posture for a considerable period of time. It was like I had been hypnotized and came to with the image of a Sri Rantra. Would you be able to speak to this in 
relation to Indo-Tibetan Yantra and the Dionysian rituals. By the way, the studio imaged then was lesser by the Oracle of Tibet. He greeted me, held my hands and looked into my eyes and always considered that a magical moment. All right, so the question here is, have you got it, sweetie? Well, yeah. um, I can't really address that. Um, the fact that this image appeared spontaneously and under those conditions is meaningful in and of itself. Um, anyone successfully practicing Kundalini type yoga, let's call it, however it's performed, um, is lending themselves to extreme experiences anyway. Okay. Um, I think the difference between what we would today call Kundalini yoga and the rites of higher initiation is that Kundalini yoga is like self-determined activity. The rites of higher initiation are surrender. Okay, you know, there, there's not a, a purposeful um, manipulation of your inner energies involved. You don't do anything. The deity does it all. Once you've come there prepared and in the right state of mind, it happens to you. You don't have to do anything. So that's the big difference. Because Kundalini is a self-directed process, it more often leads to psychic blowout and then problems of aggrandizement um, because the human constitution tends to grab hold of the energy for itself. Okay. But when you, when, you know, with the mysteries and, and those higher rights, you're not in control. The deity is in control. It's, it, it's a loss of control. It's the exact opposite in that sense. Although it may end up activating your Kundalini in an extreme way. Again, it's not something you're doing. Okay, I, I don't know. I hope that helps to clarify the, the polarity between those two approaches to development. Yes, indeed. Uh, I think that was very good, Darlin. Um, Angel wants to know that... Uh, She's noticed some relationship between the goat and the bride in other scarlet imprint books and in these frescoes with them being having that way well, sorry with them both having their eyes on the viewer any thoughts about the goats and the bride and the fact that their eyes are on the viewer yeah um the, the goats are very significant the fact that they're looking directly at us in the same way that the uh, the initiate is uh, both before and after her initiation. Um, and indeed the woman who's the, looks like the owner of the villa, again, she's very much focused out. Um, for me, it tells me that the mode of consciousness is common to all of them. And, and this, this would be consistent with Orphism, uh, with its vegetarianism, with its respect for other life forms with the notion of metapsychosis from life to life, not always necessarily in human form. Certainly Pythagoreans uh, thought that you went through all the animal forms in your spiritual evolution. So the fact the goat is looking at us directly informs us that on a level that goat has to be treated with an equality of sentience. I think that's totally appropriate for a spiritual context like that. A sacred goat. We're, they're all sacred. <laughs> no, it's, just, it's just interesting because, I, you know, you, you hear about the sacred cow so much, so that's really interesting. All right, yeah. my love, Mike would like to know, how do the Mithraic mysteries differ from the discussed Dionysian mysteries? Are they a sort of elite male corollary of the Dionysian mysteries, and are they related in any way? Wow, we could do a whole program on Mithraic mysteries. Let's <laughs> that's do it. Huge, that's a huge question. <laughs> so just give um, us the elevator pitch. Are they related? Well, what I want to say is that they're related in the sense that there's um, a common deep metaphysics driving them both. Okay. 
But the external manifestation of that is very different. And I alluded to this early on at the introduction when I said that um, whereas the mysteries in general do not have an element of trial associated with them. You know, the trial is subjective and, and you know, it emerges through the confrontation with the, the strange situation the person is in. But with the Mithraic mysteries, they actually seem to have been physical ordeals. So that we have some illustrations there in very poor um, shape right now, but we can just make them out on the walls of one of the Mithraea south of Rome in which the initiate appears to be bound, appears to be subjected to intense heat and possibly to piercing with a metal point. So what I said earlier is that in the, the Mithraic mysteries appear to be the only ones in which this kind of, um, what would you call it when somebody enters a military unit uh, and, and, and there's hazing, isn't it, right? Yes. There's an element of hazing involved in the initiation into the Mithraic mysteries that you don't see with mystery rites generally. But then the Mithraic mysteries were so much in the, <laughs> so popular with the Roman legions. I mean, uh, my own take on that is that when you're taking legionaries into a spiritual context like that, they need something extra for the convergence of you know people who've killed a lot and have been subject to extreme risk and danger for them to shift their awareness sufficiently to be able to come in contact with the deity there needs to be a different process in place and pain is one of the ways in which uh, we can so to speak get out of body Okay, and people may be aware of the, um, the native Indian rite whereby they pierce, for instance, the skin here and they put pegs through and then suspend themselves. So-called dance of the sun. So you, you're suspended all day. And the pain, you, you, you go through a pain threshold beyond which you can, you can then kind of um, perform ritualistically out of body. Okay, now this is a completely different space than the one we've been exploring. But I think at the root of the Mithraic mysteries, we have a figure called Phanes. Okay, um, and he, he's born from a cosmic egg, and the egg comes from uh, a huge serpent, Heracles. Now, this bundle of metaphysics is identical to the root of Orphism. And that's a curious feature. But as I say, we, we, we probably need a program to explore that. We that's could look at I'm we could look at relevant artistic representations, both from Mithraea and from Orphism. And uh, earlier we looked at the Orphic bowl showing the dragon, dragon force. So there, there's a certain commonality there, but the manifestation is, is completely different. I, I know, I hope that helps to answer the question it's somewhat. I mean, I, I think in the respect, you know, I think the point that really brings it home is that, that for the soldiers, a little bit of dancing and a little bit of whatever is- Probably wouldn't do it. Yeah, exactly. And so they needed to go to next level and it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 All right. Doug would like to know, do you know of any connection between the Builders Guild, the, Dionys uh, the Dionys Dionysic artifices, and mm -hmm. the practice of the mysteries? Well, one of the curious features of the Dionysian mysteries, certainly in the Greek language sphere, which includes southern Italy, um, was the development of, of what is called the Dionysian Technite. Now, what this was is a guild of initiates who were um, for hire dancers, singers, musicians, but also set builders and uh, costume and clothing makers. 
and they all had in common their devotion to the deity. Um, so for instance, when they wanted the fresco cycle painted in Pompeii, they would call upon, and there was one in Naples at that time, the Dionysian Technotide for their top artists to come over. And that was important because this artwork could only be executed by an initiate. Okay, there's no way anyone who was not a full initiate would be privy to the information that's encoded in that fresco cycle. Okay, so this is a partial answer. So the notion of the Dionysian artificers, that's to say people who actually um, constructed buildings is like a step beyond that. And my understanding is that part of the um, Western esoteric tradition is that these Dionysian artificers somehow connected up with the original cathedral builders. Now, there's a huge span of time to try, try and traverse there. And I'm not aware if there's a reliable history that lets us to do so. But I, uh, my understanding is such a connection has been made. I, I remember 19th century Masonic writing in which reference was made to the Dionysian artifices as a continuation of the mystery tradition. I don't know what the proof is, that's, that's the problem. Sweetie, I've got one, one more question that I'm going to leave to the end because it's a great ending question. Mm -hmm. So I do have repeat questions. Are you up for a few more? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right, so Kier wants to know, uh, muses, the muses or backers involved in the mysteries or was their role limited to the festivals? Okay, so were the muses okay. or backers involved in the mysteries or was their role limited to festivals and parties? Okay, so the answer to this is, is really clear because we have a text by Diodorus Siculus, that's Diodorus of Sicily, um, which is contemporary with the frescoes. And there he talks about how every other year the women come together um, and they have the festival for Dionysus and even the young unmarried girls are able to join in the festival and the, the ritual procession and everything, but only the married women would be able to go aside and conduct the mystery rites together. Okay. So anyone who was in the mystery ritual process would have been, as a, as a woman, would have had to be married and an initiate or to be initiated. Okay, it's, it's, it's one of the few questions we can give a definitive answer to based on the classical sources available to us. I hope that helps anyway. Speaking of that, Angel wants to know, uh, do you have more sources on the matron as dragon? I have one source, which is um, in Mistai. It was a a, a broken uh, funeral monument found in the Roman Forum um, and partially decoded, but it was clear that it described the woman that it, it was the funeral uh, monument for, um, a, a freed woman, and it extols her incredible uh, virtues and describes how she wore the nebris, which is that characteristic um, leopard skin of the Dionysian mysteries and describes it as a dracaena. Okay, so positioning that woman uniquely as a Dionysian priestess and giving her her cult titles engraved into the stone as nymphae and dracaena, we know exactly um, that that would have been the cult title. I hope that helps. The actual archaeological artifact is referenced in Mistai. Of course, I, I don't have that to memory. But yeah, there are a couple of papers in JSTOR, if you have access to that, which uh, decode the original Latin um, funeral stella, you know, if you, if you can get access to those. Fantastic, sweetie. Okay. Andres wants to know, 
any information you would like to reveal about your future projects currently in the world? Oh. Oof. One of the things I'm working on is um, the continuity of the priesthood of Eleusis into the early centuries of the Christian era and the connection between the art architects of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul with that spiritual community. So it points towards the possibility that the original design of the building, which has no Christian uh, imagery within it whatsoever in its original state, possibly reflected the metaphysics, Gorphic metaphysics, um, that would have been known to these architects. They were part of that school, that lineage, that spiritual lineage, descended from the priesthood of Eleusis. So that's one project that's made good progress. Um, and another one is connected with the Mithraic mysteries. That's, a, that's another one at a very early stage of development. So they're, they're the ma major two things in my hands right now. Fantastic. And, and I know you have a few other things up your sleeve too, my dear. You have a doctor coming out at some point. What's that, sorry, Denise? A documentary, don't you, as well? on the game of Saturn coming out? Well, um, we did the early pitch for that, but everything uh, as regards filmmaking these days is, is frozen because of the lockdown. So we, we can't even go on site in Italy to develop the project at this stage. So that's kind of in cold storage, um, but hopefully, who knows next year, we'll see how we, <laughs> If we can all come out of cold storage. <laughs> I know, wouldn't that be great? Um, but I have some ongoing work with Magical Egypt. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, we're going to keep you busy for a long time, darling. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> now, I just want to say, guys, uh, I'm going to, after this, I'm going to be posting the video so that for people that have come in late, uh, you can watch the entire thing again. And we'll make this the last question of the evening, darling. Um, have you partaken in contemporary mystic rituals? Yeah, I would say I have, yeah. And, uh, and it's been essential to do so in order to decode the mystery processes. I mean, uh, you can't do it without personal experience of this type of process. Uh, I think it's a point I made at the beginning pretty well. It's, you know, even anthropology, the comparative ethnography of ritual, it doesn't touch on its in, in, inner aspects, those esoteric aspects of it. And for that, you need to have direct experience to be able to talk about it. So, yes. <laughs> well, you, you have to tell the tale, which is... Uh, all I can say, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. This is amazing. And you guys, hopefully you uh, can see why this has been such a paradigm shift for me in terms of what the mysteries actually are. I want to thank you again, my love. And people are saying how much they love your voice, how much they love your laugh. And you are, you're absolutely charming and handsome and fabulous. So oh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I need that in writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, send Peter emails about how gorgeous he is. Or send them to me and I'll send them on. So, <laughs> thank you so much. I, Written we, and notarized. <laughs> Oh, look, we'll make it, I'll get a big painting and we'll put them all in the video. You hang them on your wall, darling. There you are. You're just amazing. So thank you Thank guys. you Everybody... so much. I love this session. <laughs> this is one of my favorite topics in all the world, the mysteries. Mine too, sweetie. Honestly, I, as I said, it's really just so fascinating. And, and I mean, look, these, these journeys into the numinous, are so missing, you know, and I think this is why they keep saying we have a meaning crisis in our world today. And absolutely, so it, it's it's very delicious to discuss this and to kind of get a sense of what 
we've lost and hopefully what we lost what we're missing yeah yeah absolutely, absolutely. So yeah it's yeah. it's god's work you're doing young man <laughs> 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 oh, I just had um, a lady um, wanting to return magical Egypt because she's a Christian. <laughs> and I'm, girl, I'm like, girl, this is God's work right here. So thank you, Peter. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. And um, hopefully we'll have more amazing sessions with Peter in the new year. So enjoy your holidays. Merry Christmas or happy holidays. Uh, to you, my love, and um, thank you all for showing up. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Have a good <laughs> night, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.